Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Shaping Earth's Surface. This is a student reader in Unit 2. Earth's Landforms The Grand Canyon The Grand Canyon is one of the deepest and widest canyons in the world. It is so large that it can be seen from space. At its widest, it is 29 kilometers or 18 miles across. It is 446 kilometers or 277 miles long and more than 1.6 kilometers or one mile deep. The canyon holds clues to Earth's past going back 2 million years. Like detectives, scientists study the properties of the rocks that make up the Grand Canyon. These rocks tell a story about how they were formed and what the environment was like when they were formed. By studying the rocks, scientists have learned that Earth's surface is always changing. Properties of rocks. The Grand Canyon is made up of many different kinds of rocks. Rocks make up the surface of Earth and other terrestrial objects, including planets and moons. They are kinds of matter made up of mixtures of different minerals. Minerals are naturally occurring. This means they are not made by humans. They would exist on Earth without people. Minerals are also inorganic. This is because they are not the product of something that is living or was once alive. Leaves and shells are organic because they come from something that was once alive. Minerals also have a definite chemical composition. This means that every mineral is made up of the same kind of number of atoms, kind and number of atoms. Lastly, minerals have an orderly crystal structure. This means their atoms are neatly organized to form a repeating pattern. When minerals are pressed together by heat and pressure, they can combine to form different kinds of rocks. Changing planet. The clues in Earth's rocks tell scientists that Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The rocks also provide evidence for how the land has changed many times since then. Scientists believe the Grand Canyon formed 5.5 million years ago. Before that, nearly 2 billion years ago, mountains rose 10 kilometers or 6 miles above sea level where the Grand Canyon is today. This is as high as the Himalaya are. Over time, the mountains wore down. The land became flat. Oceans covered it. And then a major disturbance changed the land. This disturbance pushed up the entire seabed to form a plateau. A plateau is an area of land that is relatively flat and significantly higher than the surrounding area. Scientists can learn about all of these changes from the layers of the Grand Canyon's rocks. They do this by analyzing the properties of the rock. They look at the size, shape, and arrangement of sedimentary particles. They also look at the rock's color and its hardness. These properties tell scientists about Earth's environment over time. For example, sediment may reveal ancient oceans, glaciers, and swamps that existed and disappeared over time. For example, some of the upper layers of the canyon are made up of rocks formed at the bottom of the ocean. The only way these rocks could end 14,484 kilometers or 9,000 feet up in the air was if the land that was once the seabed were suddenly pushed upward. Earth's structure. To understand how a seabed might end up 14,484 kilometers above ground, it is important to start with Earth's structure. Earth is divided into four layers. Scientists learn about the inside of Earth by studying rocks on the surface. The center of Earth is a solid ball of metal iron and nickel. It is called the inner core. The core is 7,000 degrees Celsius. This is hotter than the surface of the sun. The outer core wraps around the inner core and is made of liquid iron and nickel. The mantle is located around the outer core. The mantle is Earth's thickest layer. Imagine an apple. The core of the apple is like Earth's core. The fleshy part that you eat is like the mantle. Earth's mantle is an ocean of semi-solid rock called magma. Earth's skin is its crust. 
The solid crust is the coolest layer of the planet. It forms the continents and holds the oceans. Plate tectonics. Earth's crust is broken into drifting slabs of solid rock called tectonic plates. The plates cause Earth's surface to look like a jigsaw puzzle. Heat from Earth's core causes the liquid rock of Earth's mantle to rise and fall like ocean tides. As magma moves beneath the crust, it pushes the tectonic plates toward or away from each other. The places where Earth's tectonic plates meet are called fault lines. The different movements of the tectonic plates change the surface of Earth. The movement of the plates is what caused the ancient seabed to lift high up into the air and created a plateau. When two tectonic plates collide, the force is so powerful that the land is uplifted and mountain ranges can form. When two plates moves, move towards one another perpendicular to the fault line, they form a convergent boundary. Most colliding plates create mountains. Scientists still don't know why a plateau not a mountain range was created where the Grand Canyon is today. The colliding tectonic plates can also result in earthquakes and volcanoes. Earthquakes are vibrations caused by the movement of tectonic plates. Volcanoes are structures formed around a hole in Earth's crust that releases magma. When plates move, holes can open up in Earth's surface. This allows magna from the mantle to ooze into the crust and form volcanoes. Sometimes two plates move apart from one another perpendicular to the fault line. These plates form a divergent boundary. This movement creates ocean trenches and valleys. It can also result in earthquakes and volcanoes. Transform boundaries are formed when two plates slide past each other in parallel, grinding along their sides as they go. This causes many earthquakes along the fault. Landform patterns. There is a cause and effect relationship between the movement of Earth's tectonic plates and the location of mountain ranges, earthquakes and volcanoes on Earth's surface. As a result of this cause and effect relationship, mountains, valleys, earthquakes, and volcanoes are common at fault lines. This results in patterns in their location. For example, volcanoes and earthquakes often occur along the boundaries between continents and oceans. A continent is a main landmass on the planet that is made up of part of a tectonic plate. There are seven continents, Africa, Europe, Asia, North America, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. Major mountain chains form inside continents or near their edges. A changing planet, the Colorado River. The Grand Canyon would not exist without the Colorado River. It is because of the river that the canyon is as wide and deep as it is. It is also because of the river that we can see all of the layers in the rocks of the canyon. The Colorado River is 2,330 kilometers or 1,450 miles long and 91 meters or 300 feet wide. It begins in the Rocky Mountains before it reaches the Grand Canyon. It gets its name from the Spanish word for red color. The river used to look red because of the red sandstone sediment of the land. Sediment is a collection of particles of rocks, minerals, and the remains of plants and animals. It collects in layers over time. As the Colorado River moves, it shapes the land underneath. It carries with it pieces of the red sandstone. It flows over. It does this through weathering and erosion. Weathering is the breakdown of rock into small pieces from exposure to wind, water, gravity, changes in temperature, and or biological forces such as plants or animals. Wind, water, or gravity then transports the sediment to new locations in a process called erosion. Weathering and erosion often work together. For example, Wind and water carry pieces of sediment that grind against rock and wear it away. Water can also seep into cracks between rocky particles and expand, making cracks larger. Over time, the rock wears down from the inside and crumbles into sediment, which then gets carried away.
How does a mountain become flat? Weathering and erosion are so powerful that they can cause tall mountains be to become flat over time. Weathering and erosion can also cut through the land, carving out a canyon so large it could be seen from space. How can moving water do this? The Colorado River is one of the most powerful rivers in the world. It is so powerful that it can carry large pieces of sediment, including large boulders in its flow. The Grand Canyon is so deep because the rocks carried along in the river act like tools. They chip off pieces of the riverbed as they are carried along. This process causes large amounts of rock to be weathered and eroded. Scientists estimate that 1 billion tons of rock have been carved out of the land to form the Grand Canyon. Energy in wind and water. The Colorado River transforms the land because like all moving water, it has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Gravity pulls downward on all water on Earth's surface. This force causes water to move downhill. The Colorado River is so powerful because it begins high up in the Rocky Mountains. It starts out 2,743 meters, or 9,000 feet, above sea level. This steepness is one of the reasons that the Colorado River is so powerful. At that height, the Colorado River has a lot of stored, or potential, gravitational energy. For every mile the Colorado River travels, it falls three meters, or 10 feet. As it falls, it converts gravitational energy into kinetic energy and picks up strength. People can capture this energy to do work. Technologies such as hydroelectric dams capture the energy in water. They can turn the energy into a form of energy called electricity. Wind also has kinetic energy. Wind and water are both examples of renewable energy sources. Renewable sources are those resources that can be replenished in a short period of time. For example, the Glen Canyon Dam sits on the Colorado River. People use the dam to capture the river's energy. They turn the energy into electricity that powers our lights, electronics, and other appliances. Reading Clues in Rocks, Visiting the Grand Canyon. In 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt visited the Grand Canyon. When he saw it, he said, the Grand Canyon fills me with awe. It is beyond comparison. The Grand Canyon is part of a national park. This means that the land is available to the public. It is a popular tourist destination. Every year, more than 5 million people visit the canyon. It is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Many people visit the Grand Canyon to see its natural beauty and size. It also holds one of the most complete geologic records of Earth's history in its layers. Geology is the study of Earth's structure and history, as well as the processes that shape it. Studying the canyon's layers. Most of the rocks in the Grand Canyon are sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks form from sediment that comes from weathering and erosion. Wind and water weather the rocks and then erode the sediment. Layers of sediment gradually build up over time. Over thousands or millions of years, the pressure of more and more top layers of sediment compresses the layers of sediment into solid rock. Because of this, the oldest sediment forms the bottommost layers of the rock. Newer layers replace older layers at the top. The walls of the Grand Canyon show all the different layers of sediment that built up over millions of years. The bottom of the Grand Canyon has rocks that are 2,000 million years old. Categories of rock. There are two other categories of rock, metamorphic and igneous. Scientists classify rocks based on how they form. Metamorphic rocks form in chemical reactions where one type of rock is changed by pressure or heat into a new type of rock with different properties. The movement of Earth's tectonic plates pushes rocks deep into the crust. The heat and pressure of all the weight on top of it causes chem cause chemical reactions. In a chemical reaction, the atom and molecules that make up the substance are rearranged to form new matter with different properties. The word metamorphose means to change. 
it can take millions of years for a metamorphic rock to form. Igneous rocks form when hot liquid magma from Earth's mantle cools into solid form. Igneous rocks are often found under volcanoes. The magma either cools slowly below Earth's surface or is released as lava through volcanoes. The cooled lava hardens into igneous rock. The rock cycle. Rocks do not remain the same forever. The matter that makes them up cycles and changes into different kinds of rocks over time. For example, rocks break down into sediment. That sediment can collect in layers. Over time, heat and pressure can compress the layers of sediment into new sedimentary rock. Or tectonic plates can push the sediment deep into Earth's crust. There, it can undergo chemical reaction that change its properties, turning it into metamorphic rock. With enough time, any rock pushed deep into Earth's interior will melt into magma. If magma reaches the surface, it will cool and harden into rock again. Weathering and erosion happen to all rocks on Earth's surface. The processes that form, break down, and reform rock from one category to another are called the rock cycle. Ocean to desert. The Colorado River has weathered and eroded the rock to carve out the Grand Canyon. Because of this, we can see the different layers that have formed over time. Each layer represents a period of time, often with a different climate or geography. The land around the Grand Canyon is now a desert. This means that it is dry and doesn't receive a lot of rain. But studying the rock layers of the Grand Canyon show that an ocean covered the land at least eight times in the past. The last time the land was covered by an ocean was 80 million years ago. Scientists can tell when an ocean covered the land because the water left behind different types of materials each time. Those materials then hardened to become solid rock. Some of the material was sand that became tan colored sandstone. Some was mud that hardened into darker shale. The calcified remains of marine organisms turned into light colored limestone. How fossils form. The Grand Canyon also holds clues about past life and changing environments. This is because of the fossils held in its rock. Fossils are the remains of ancient animals and plants, the traces or impressions of living things from past geologic ages, or the traces of their activities. Sedimentary rock often holds fossils. As sediment builds up, it often traps, it often trapped and preserved remains of living things. These remains include whole plants and animals. They also include traces of organisms, such as footprints. Fossils include bones, teeth, wood, and shells. Another kind of fossil is called a trace fossil. It is an imprint or evidence of a living thing left behind in rock. The trace fossil may be of a footprint or an entire organism. Trace fossils help scientists understand how and where an animal rested, moved, or fed. Footprints, worm burrows, and insect nests are examples of trace fossils. Fossils as fuels. Fossils hold stored chemical energy. Remember that all matter has chemical energy. This energy is stored in the bonds that hold together atoms and molecules. When living things die and turn into fossils, the remains store that chemical energy. Under the right conditions, heat and pressure compress all of this matter. Over millions of years, the matter can transform into coal, oil, or natural gas. The gasoline that powers your car came from organisms that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. That is why we call gasoline a fossil fuel. Fossil fuels include gasoline, or oil, coal, and natural gas. When they are burned, fossil fuels release their stored chemical energy. Unlike the energy in wind and water, fossil fuels are a non-renewable resource. They take millions of years to form. Scientists study fossils to learn more about Earth's history. The fossil record includes all of the fossils that have ever been found, which scientists use to understand Earth's history. Because of how fossils are made, 
the fossils that are found in lower layers of the rock are more ancient than fossils found in higher layers. Some of the oldest fossils found in the Grand Canyon are 1,200 million years old. There are also many fossils formed much later, between 525 and 270 million years old. Many of the fossils found in the Grand Canyon are marine fossils. This means that the organisms once lived in the ocean. A common marine fossil is the brachiopod. These animals lived on the ocean floor. There are many fossils of plants, including ferns, in the layers of the Grand Canyon. Most of these fossils are trace fossils. Evidence for past changes. How could an ocean have covered what is now the Grand Canyon? The answer has to do with the movement of Earth's tectonic plates. As the tectonic plates drift on Earth's magma, they change Earth's surface. For example, between 2.5 and 1.8 billion years ago, scientists believe that sediment, including sand, mud, and ash, was deposited in a marine basin. Then, at least two volcanic islands and a tectonic plate converged. This motion caused the marine sediment to get pushed upward. Over time, the tectonic plates shifted again. The rocks got buried and more sediment was deposited on top of them. Scientists have been able to piece together this history by reading the clues in the rocks. They study the properties of each of the layers as well as any fossils found. The processes that formed the canyon continue today, repeating over and over. This means that the canyon is continuing to change and will likely look very different in a million years from today. The location of certain fossils around the world also show how Earth has changed over millions of years. For example, fossils of tropical plants have been found in Antarctica, the coldest continent on Earth. This evidence suggests that Earth's climate has changed dramatically over the years and that Antarctica was probably much warmer than it is today. In the 1900s, scientists began to notice that the seven continents fit together like puzzle pieces. They had a hypothesis that the continents were once joined together as a supercontinent. This supercontinent is called Pangaea. After studying rocks and fossils from different coastlines, they found evidence for this hypothesis. Scientists found fossils of an ancient fern on the continents of South America and Africa. This was evidence that the two continents had been connected as part of Pangaea. Pangaea began breaking into seven continents about 200 million years ago as the plates underneath the continents moved away from each other. A fossil survey. Brachiopods are small marine shellfish animals. They have valves or shells on their upper and lower surfaces. A brachiopod attaches itself to a rock or burrows into the seafloor using a foot or a pedicle. Most brachiopods are now extinct. However, some modern species of brachiopods still exist today. The rugosa is a type of extinct coral. Corals are simple animals that form skeletons made of calcium carbonate taken from ocean water. These skeletons form reefs in the ocean. Rugosa are called horned corals because of the horn-shaped wrinkled structure built around the coral animal. Plants, like ferns, can leave impressions or traces of their structures behind if the plant traces are preserved in just the right way. Trace fossils, like the fern on the right, are most often formed in soft sediments like mud. They are usually preserved only if the sediment remains undisturbed until it has become rock. The fern on the right belongs to a terrestrial or a land plant, right? So here's the present day fern and here's the fossilized fern. Dinosaur bones are often larger than other animal bones, but not always. Scientists often find many dinosaur bone fragments that are too small or broken up to be identified. Dinosaur bone fragments, like the one on the right, can be fossilized and preserved. In this process, the dinosaur bone material is slowly replaced over time with mineral deposits. The dinosaur bone on the right belongs to a terrestrial or land animal.
Wow. I learned a lot reading Shaping Earth's Surface. I hope you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye.